Everybody, welcome. Welcome to my second talk on Naples. And those who are present my, for my first one already know about the many wonders of this top favorite of mine and why at least once a year I have to spend a few days in Naples. I'm often there with my dear friend from Rome, Silvana, connecting with friends like Adriano and Roberta. You'll meet them tonight in my talk and never really seeing sufficiently everything I'd like to see in Naples. As the old saying is, vedi Napoli e poi mori, you can see Naples and then die, meaning you don't want to go on into the next life until you've seen Naples and more than for just a few days. As we'll see in this talk, Naples is a regal city, a regal city of nobility, We'll visit the most important Gothic edifice in the town and the largest church, housing nearly two dozen tombs of kings, queens, and those who worked for the royalty, who assisted the royal courts. All dating from the 14th to 17th century, these magnificent artworks, these tombs. The Neapolitan nobility is even present in the 16th century working class section we'll visit tonight, the Quartieri Spagnoli. And uh, you'll see, we will see in the Quartieri Spagnoli some of the noble street art of that city. That is the wall paintings, uh, immortalizing other nobility of Naples, if you will, contemporary nobility. That is the beloved film directors, actors, musicians of Naples. And we can't leave Naples without a stop in one of the town's wonderful trattoria, one of the best eating places in Naples. And in this uh, trattoria, we will fully live the Neapolitan spirit in this city where, as quoted on one of the walls, culture is the on only salvation. Hoping to meet one day to go together to Naples, let's live it now. The Basilica of Santa Chiara in Naples is a regal church. And not just because it houses the tombs, the noble tombs of the Angevin family and people who assisted them in their courts, but also for the elegance of this beautiful church. It was constructed to house the bodies of the descendants of Roberto Primo, Robert I of the Angevins, and he was called Il Saggio, the wise, a king very beloved by the Neapolitan people. And his throne is over, he is enthroned in his tomb over the altar. This is an interesting church because there is no apse. Behind the altar is the tomb of the beloved king, Roberto Primo Angevin. On the right, you see a detail of a beautiful fresco by Simone Martini, early 14th century, depicting the king as he's being crowned. And he's being crowned by his brother. Here is um, the full version of the detail I just showed you. This is a wooden panel. It is over 10 feet tall. Simone Martini painted on wood between 1317 and 1319. This is the most important Angevin work still surviving in the city of Naples. And it was done while uh, Roberto I was alive and was king. It is in the marvelous Capo di Monte Museum in Naples, a not to miss spot when you're there. And in this panel uh, right in front of us on the right, we're seeing a double crowning. Angels bear an elegant crown to crown not the king, but Louis of Toulouse. He was destined to be king, but he renounces his throne to take on a life of poverty as a Franciscan. We know him as St. Louis of Toulouse. The Italians know him as San Luigi dei Francesi, St. Louis of the French. In this panel by Simone Martini, he's wearing an elegant cloak, all trimmed with gold. He's carrying the golden scepter of the bishop. And the second crowning is being done by Bishop Louis of Toulouse. He's crowning his brother. Roberto d'Anjou, who will be king 
of the kingdom of uh, Naples in his place because he's opting for the monastic life of a Franciscan. When you enter the Basilica of Santa Chiara on the floor in marble inlay is the coat of arms of the Angevin family done by Ferdinando Fuga in 1762. Simone Martini also frescoed in Assisi. Some of you have been to see this fresco with me in person on one of my Assisi tours. Others might have seen it in one of my talks on Assisi. This fresco, done between 1318 and 1319 by Simone Martini, is in the lower Basilica of St. Francis. The Sienese master has depicted uh, St. Louis of Toulouse, or San Luigi dei Francesi, as the Italians would say, in the garb of bishop. He has an elegant bishop's mitre, an elegant golden crozier. But look what's under his cloak, the poor habit of the Franciscans. To his left is the founder of his order, Francis of Assisi. We can see the stigmata in his hands, the sword wound in his side. First saint recognized by the church to have had the wounds of Christ. There's a magnificent depiction of uh, King Roberto Primo il Saggio in a 14th century manuscript, which is in the Biblioteca Nazionale of Florence. That is the National Library. This is a magnificent uh, depiction of the king. This is a small detail of this exquisite manuscript. And I've placed it next to a map of Italy, which designates for you the kingdom of Naples, of which he was king, Regno di Napoli. All the lighter orange is his kingdom. So you can see that it includes part of Abruzzo, Puglia, Basilicata, Calabria, all the region of Campania. To the north and yellow, Papal States, which include Latium, the Marches region, and our Umbria. King Roberto il Saggio, Roberto the Wise, decides with his wife, Sancha di Mallorca, to build a Franciscan church in 1310, which will be the Basilica of Santa Chiara. Um, Sancha is a very, very devout woman. She wished to actually become a cloistered poor Claire. She reneges on that to become queen. And I believe that after Roberto D'Anjou's death, Roberto the Angevin, she enters, if I'm not mistaken, the poor Claire's convent attached to the Basilica of Santa Chiara because they created a monumental citadel, these two. They created, they, they financed the church, they financed the cloisters near it, they financed a Franciscan convent, a Franciscan monastery. Here we have Sancha, next to Roberto il Saggio, Roberto the Wise, and she's delicately touching the head of two of her granddaughters, Giovanna, who will become first queen of the kingdom of Naples, and Maria, and Maria's tomb we will see in my presentation, absolutely elegant, and of course, uh, buried in this Basilica of Santa Chiara. This is a view of the immense Basilica di Santa Chiara, the largest church in Naples, a massive Gothic building. It was built between 1310 and 1328 by an architect called Gagliardo Primario. And it was originally called Delostia Santa of the Sacred Host. And it is called the Sacred Host because of the fact that it was built just about 50 years, a little bit more than 50 years after the miracle of Lake Bolsena, the Eucharistic miracle, which those of you who heard my Bolsena talk might remember. If you heard my Orviata talk, you might remember. In 1263, um, a Bohemian priest on his way to Rome with great doubts about the transubstantiation that the body of Christ becomes, that the host becomes the body of Christ. When he's lifting up the host at mass in the church of Bolsena, blood drips down onto the sacred corporal. The sacred corporal is brought to Orvieto. Pope Urban IV is there. 
and he will mandate the uh, dogma of Corpus Domini, Corpus Christi, or Body of Christ, which, as we know from my spell of talk, is celebrated every year in Umbria with the magnificent flower petal carpets on the streets of Spello. Some of you have seen that talk. Um, and the host is carried across the magnificent flower tapestries. So these monarchs of the kingdom of Naples, Il Regno di Napoli, had great devotion to the sacred host. And the church is named that. It will later be called Santa Chiara. As mentioned, um, the reigning uh, king who's buried here, or the one who reigns in greatest glory in this church, is Roberto I, the Angevin king. His uh, beautiful tomb was created by two sculptors, brothers from Tuscany, Giovanni and Paci Bertini, in 1343. In this photo on the right, which is a bit of an enlargement, you can see the wooden crucifix, a very beautiful piece done by an unknown Sienese master, early 14th century. And there's Roberto il Saggio, Roberto the Wise, at the top of his sepulcher, looking very solemnly out at those coming into the church. Now, in the 17th century, the church was redone in the Baroque style. And this is what that altarpiece area looked like in the 17th century. We're going to talk about the bombing of this church in World War II. And after the bombing, the church was restored in the original Gothic style. So this is the tomb as you see it today. This is how you would have seen the tomb uh, in the 17th century. This Basilica of Santa Chiara, I've said, is a monumental citadel. It's the most important Angevin edifice in Naples. And it includes not just the church, but four monumental cloisters. One of them we talked about in my first uh, Naples presentation because I mentioned the beautiful Maiolica artwork in this cloister. And here we have a photo of this. Uh, all Maiolica uh, this double-fired pottery, Maiolica cloister, and this was designed by the architect Domenico Antonio Vaccaro in the 17th century, the same person who transformed the church into a Baroque edifice, Vaccaro. Domenico Antonio Vaccaro, Napolitano. This is an important um, area. This is the Basilica of St. Clair here. You can see this is one of the cloisters. And under the church and the cloister area, under the cloister area, I believe, are archaeological excavations uh, of the Roman period because the baths were here. And it's said that the Roman baths here probably were in use until the 4th century. And this is uh, Domenico Antonio Vaccaro. And excuse me, I wrote 18th century. That is my error, 17th century. And this is the Baroque Church of Naples. Very different from what it looks like now. I'm going to take you back to the first slide. Let's see. Here's the Baroque. And here it is restored to a Gothic structure as it would have first been in the 14th century after um, World War II. Now, Baroque. Why Baroque at this period of time? Because at this period of time, the Baroque edifice would have been appropriate to the most important city in Italy. Naples was the most important city and economically the most advanced city in Italy at this time, as represented, look at this beautiful painting by Antonio Jolie of, an, of 18th century Naples. It was four times bigger than Rome, twice as big as Milan, far bigger than New York or Tokyo. So it was appropriate that in this elegant, important city of Naples, that the architecture of the Gothic church should be updated and modernized, and hence it then became Baroque. And then tragedy. August 4th, 1943, bombed by the Allies, burned for two days. 
heartbreak, heartbreak, heartbreak. And restoration went on for 10 years. It reopens to the public in 1953, and the decision was made to uh, recreate it as a Gothic edifice. This is the beautiful uh, marble floor. There was some damage to it, it was restored. This is the coat of arms right here. You might remember we saw in the beginning of the Angevin family. There are 20 side chapels, 10 on each side. And in these side chapels are the elegant tombs dating from the 14th to 17th century of over 20 persons of the nobility of Naples and those who worked for them and were key advisors to the reigning monarchs who mandated that they too be buried in this basilica built specifically to house the bodies of the Angevins. And this is a photo you can see on the left of the altar. Look at that. After the bombing of 1943, what a tragedy war is. August 4th, Allies bombed it. They also bombed the Jesu Church across the street. The bomb didn't go off. The Jesu Church is a magnificent edifice. That will be for another talk. In 1945, Michele Galdieri and Alberto Barberis wrote a song, much beloved of by the Neapolitans, and sung by many different famous singers, Monasterio e Santa Chiara. This is a Neapolitan dialect. Um, the feelings the people have for their beautiful monastery of Santa Chiara. This is uh, Claudio Villa singing here a famous song. I'm just going to give you a little bit of a clip of this. And it is a song about the pain of someone away from the city thinking about the Monastero Santa Chiara, which this is written in 1945, was lost two years prior. He's singing in Neapolitan dialect. And Rick, maybe you could put this in the chat room. People want to hear the full song. This is Claudio Villa. You're the Neapolitan. So dark. This is Naples for me, he's saying. It's a heartbreak for the people. This will also become the soundtrack of a movie that came out in 1945, The Monastery of Santa Chiara, which I think you can see on YouTube. I haven't seen it, but in my search for it, I came across um, the link. As I mentioned, many exquisite tombs in this uh, exquisite church. Uh, I think one of the most beautiful is this one. It is called the Tomb of the Unknown Nun. And the master of this was uh, the Maestro di Durazzesco, he's called, and I'll tell you why this name in a second. Uh, this was sculpted in the 14th century, probably by someone in the school of the Bertini brothers, the brothers who created the beautiful tomb of the King Robert. This is absolutely an exquisite piece, recently restored, and you want to look at, we want to look at the detail here. We have Mary, Queen of Heaven crowned, holding the Christ child who is blessing. They are flanked by two coats of arms, possibly noble coats of arms, because there's a theory that this woman who wished to be buried as a nun, a simple nun, was a nobility and maybe had entered a cloister as Sancha did after the death of her husband, or maybe wished to be buried in garb which was humble rather than noble. We don't know. And flanking the Virgin on the left is Francis of Assisi holding the cross and the rule of the order, and flanking the Virgin on the right as we look at her is Claire of Assisi, after all this is her church, holding the lily, symbol of purity. Maestro Durazzesco. The name of this unknown sculptor 
is given because he also sculpted the tomb of Maria Durazzo. So his name means the master of du the master, which is Durazzo Esh. Maria Durazzo. Durazzo, as you probably know, is in Albania. And at this time, it was also part of the kingdom of Naples. Maria, the Maria Durazzo was a granddaughter of Roberto I. And this tomb was sculpted in the mid 14th century. Uh, we saw in that um, image that we started with in the illuminated manuscripts, uh, Queen Sacha touching the heads of two of her granddaughters, Giovanna, who will become the first queen, and Maria Durazzo. And this is the tomb of Maria Durazzo. Here, angels are pulling back the curtain so we can gaze on her body. And below her, we have sculpted the Blessed Virgin, flanked by angels, uh, St. Paul, St. Peter, and two other saints flanking her. Now, I want to show you the location of this tomb. This is it. Right here to the left of the tomb of her grandfather, Robert I. And the tomb also is topped by a crucifixion here. You can see the beautiful floor. It's interesting in the Church of Santa Chiara that when you come in, you're seeing right away as you enter on the contrafacciata, which will be the counter facade, that is the, the back wall. I found it very interesting that right away I'm encountering tombs, one of nobility and one of someone who served the nobility. And the people who serve the nobility are as important in a way, at least in the presentation of their tombs, as are the nobility. So as you enter this church, on the right is the tomb of nobility. Agnese and Clemenza, Angevin princesses and daughters of Maria di Durazzo. And here again, the angels pull back the drapery so one can view the deceased, if you will, who will be buried in here. And below her is what's called a compianto in Italian, means to cry with. And we would call this really a pietà. And there's the Virgin holding the hand of her son in great pain. And John the Beloved rips open his tunic. Um, so um, in such pain he is over the death of Christ. And below the tomb are two statues, and they're like little caryatids, as if they're holding up the temples. One is of faith and one is of charity. To the left of the door, as you enter on the contrafacciato, is instead the tomb of someone who served nobility, Antonio Penna. And he was an administrative assistant of the King Ladislao, who was also an heir of Roberto I. And uh, his name is sometimes Antonio de Penne. And this beautiful tomb was sculpted by Antonio Baboccio da Piperno, who was uh, a ma marvelous artist from the area of Latium, who created this tomb in the early 15th century. At one time, under this baldacchino, all sculpted, was the tomb. The tomb was later moved to a side chapel. Next to the baldacchino, which had one time overlooked the tomb, was the lid of another sarcophagus. And here's a detail of it. Uh, this is one of the De Penne or Penne. This could be Antonio. This could be Onofrio, who's a brother. And he had a nephew who was called Onofrio, uh, both um, assisting the nobility, the kings. And here he has the courtly dress of somebody who works in the courts of a king. Very, very beautifully done and very fine sculpting of the folds of the drapery and so forth. Now, I want to zero in here on what is under the um, baldacchino, this canopy. We have the pietà. And this is the pietà representation, which we also saw similar to the one in the Cathedral of Todi, as some of you may remember. And in the pietà, we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three gods in one. We don't know who the artist was. We call him an artist of the Scuola Giotesca 
influenced by the magnificent painter Giotto, who worked in the Basilica of St. Francis, very, very end of the 13th century, very, very beginning of the 14th century. The columns of this baldacchino are held up by finely sculpted, um, the f columns are finely sculpted with intertwining grapevines. Now, the tomb which was at one time here, was moved to a side chapel. And here's the tomb. This is an early 15th century tomb of Antonio Penna, moved to a side chapel in the 17th century, and by Antonio Baboto da Piperno, who was a sculptor, a painter, an architect, and a goldsmith, one of the finest artists of Naples in the early 15th century. And under the reclining deceased, we have a Franciscan, Anthony of Padua, and these are hermit saints who also joined John the Baptist. You can see him in the traditional gesture. He's pointing because he is the precursor of Christ. So he is pointing. Here is the Lamb of God on Eus Dei. Another magnificent tomb is that of Drugo Merlotto, and he was the last of the Neapolitan Templars. And the Templars were the most skilled combative, combative troops, the combat unit of the Crusades. The Templars founded in the early 12th century, and he was the last of the Neapolitan Templars defending the sacred sites of the Holy Land. His tomb is absolutely exquisite. He was a very appreciated and esteemed knight. And we have on his tomb, San Francesco and San Luigi di Toluzzo or St. Louis of the French. This is an early 14th century tomb. In the same chapel opposite is another Merlotto, Nicola Merlotto. And this has a wonderful detail. Look at under his feet. It's his playful little dog looking sadly and wistfully at his deceased master, who was also a knight. He has a sword uh, near his side and so forth. A magnificent tomb, the virgin and child flanked by angels. And on her right is Catherine of Alexandria, who was drawn and quartered on the wheel. And on her left is St. Agnes. Her symbol is the lamb. St. Peter. And St. Paul also figure on the tomb. This is an absolutely exquisite piece. I am not kidding. In that church, I don't know how long I was there. Well over an hour. And just left feeling there was so, so much to see. An hour on my last visit, and it was not my first visit to Santa Chiara. It's an absolutely stunning museum of some of the finest sculpture you can imagine or see in Italy of 14th century to 17th century. Look at this one. Another one. And Raimondo Cabano also has at his feet his playful little dog. And he was a knight, as you can tell. Look at his dressing, his clothing. And Raimondo Cabano, this is a very, very interesting tomb. And this is a very, very interesting personage because this person was black. He was from North Africa. He was called L'Ethiope, the Ethiopian. He was brought as a slave to Naples. He was liberated by um, Caban, Cabano, who gave him his name. He then became the steward of Roberto I. He's one of the five knights buried in Santa Chiara, and he was one of the wealthiest landowners of Naples. On all my research, I found a very interesting piece by a young woman who wrote her thesis recently on him and this tomb. And she said, we Napolitani took in the immigrants from North Africa in the 14th century. Let us continue to do so. And she wrote a whole thesis on this tomb and combining it with information on the situation of immigration now into Naples. Absolutely fascinating. Here's a detail now. Let me just see if I can show you. Yes, of his tomb. Isn't that something? You can see the headdress and so forth of the knight and all the detail here of his armor. Tomb of... Um, Cabano, the Ethiopian. 
Of course, in this church, there has to be the tomb of uh, the chapel dedicated to San Francesco. It's the tomb of the Dalbazzo family. This becomes their tomb as of the 17th century. Their tombs date to 300 years prior. But as of the 17th century, they are given permission to take possession of this tomb. A highlight of this chapel is the exquisite 17th century sculpture of San Francesco, which had been in another Naples church and was moved here in the 17th century. The tombs here are absolutely exquisite. We're going to zero in on them. To the left of Francis is the 14th century tomb of Count Raimondo dal Balzo, top advisor to Regina Giovanna, who was the first queen of Naples, granddaughter of Roberta I. And here she is, angels again pulling back the drapery so we can view her body. And um, the artists are of the school of Bertini of the 14th century. And the, uh, they're here flanking Raimondo dal Balzo. Now, he was, as mentioned, top advisor to the queen, Giovanna. And therefore, you can imagine his uh, trips out to the countryside, hunting and so forth. And all his advisors are flanking this gentleman who's very elderly because this was made his tomb just after his death. And they're holding falcons. Again, School of Bertini, they are the ones who sculpted the tomb of Roberto over the altar. And you can see three virtues holding up the tomb. And opposite Raimondo's tomb is the tomb of Isabella Appia, his third wife, who died in 1375. And there she is looking very solemn, flanked by her ladies-in-waiting and virtues holding up her tomb, uh, presumably faith, hope, and charity. But they represent three virtues. And if you look at her, boy, dogs are loved on this tomb. She's holding her favorite little puppy dog. She looks very solemn and very serious. And above the tombs are um, set into the wall images of other members of the Del Balzo nobility who are buried here. And their coat of arms is done in marble on the floor. Let's see. And before I left the Church of Santa Chiara, my last visit, of course, I had to stop as everyone will stop at the tomb of Salvo d'Aquisto. And the Neapolitans rightly believe he should be buried with the greatest nobility of Naples for his noble gesture, which took place in 1943, when he was 20 years old. Let's look at this young man again. He was a carabinieri. And he was on duty, I think, in a, he won the Medal of Gold Honor, Military um, Valor. He was in a village of Latium, and it's 1943, the Nazis were there, and they rounded up 20 villagers, and they were going to be executed. And he said, let them go and take me. And they let the villagers go, and they killed him. So he gave up his life for the 20 villagers. And there's uh, a carabinieri in his dress of honor next to his tomb in a, at a special event here in the Basilica of Santa Chiara. And when I visited there the last time, I came out and the carabinieri were coming out of the carabinieri band and they'd had a special event there. And I'm sure that all of them paid tribute at the tomb of Salvo d'Aquisto. Now we're going to leave the Church of Nobility and go into another area, which is noble for me of Naples. And it is the working class neighborhood called the Quartieri Spagnoli, the Spanish district. And I talked about it uh, somewhat in my first Naples talk when we visited the tomb of the Argentinian soccer player and saw all the murals in the Quartieri Spagnoli. The Quartieri Spagnoli's origin are early 16th century, 1536. You can see here on the symbol of the Quartieri Spagnoli, 
And this was the area to house the Spanish garrisons, the Spanish military who had to keep the eyes on the Neapolitan people and get them to behave. And as you can imagine, in a quarter where the military were housed, all kinds of things went on, such as, uh, I don't know, prostitution, um, excessive drinking, entertainment, and so forth. And I don't know if this is the start of the negative image of the Quartieri Spagnoli. Certainly has to be reevaluated as a not to miss extraordinary district of Naples. And I'm going to just show it to you here. It is a grid of 12 streets by 8 streets. Narrow streets, wash hanging out. Sometimes they drop the basket down for their shopping called the panada. We talked about that in my first talk. We'll talk about it today, too. Come bella la città. How beautiful is the city, right? The Quartieri Spagnoli. The Spanish Quarter, a marvelous neighborhood right in the center. Wonderful food in these little trattorie. Shops tucked away. Over 200 murals on the walls. I think maybe up to about 300 murals on the walls. We're going to see some of them. And this is also where the trattorie is, which we'll stop in for our last visit here to Naples. And look at how clean the streets are. In certain places, you can see people in front of the buildings sweeping the streets, in front of these crumbling buildings. Look at, there's not trash on these streets. The Quartieri Spagnoli. Wash hanging out. <laughs> and this is a, um, a little uh, procession in the Quartieri Spagnoli, I think for the Feast of the Sorrowful Mother. Here you can see a fruit and vegetable vendor. These are very indicative of the whole spirit of the Quartieri Spagnoli. And that the frescoes are very famous. Um, a lot of these frescoes were done as of 1990 and beyond, but some years before, and there I well over 200, if I'm not mistaken to say even over 300, including frescoes. This is on a garage door depicting the coastline of Naples. Frescoes depicting beloved actors, Toto, uh, Peppino de Filippo, his actor, film writer, script writer, Maradona, uh, the soccer player from Argentina who brought Naples to two championships and is considered a god in Naples. Sophia Loren, of course. Pino Daniele, uh, marvelous blues singer, blues and jazz. And as our Neapolitan friend Adriano knows, I love Pino Daniele's music. So under this fresco of Pino Daniele, he sang to me my favorite Pino Daniele song. And Rick, if you could put that into our chat as well. Napoli, as the way the Neapolitans would say it. N-A-P-U-L-E, Napoli. <coughs> I didn't, excuse me, I didn't have time to put this into my talk, but one of the most memorable events of my life was being in Naples, maybe it was 2015, in one of the main piazzas with the Neapolitan people for the funeral of Pino Daniele. I, I have no words to describe it. Please, Rick, put this in. Go to my blog and put in the search Pino Daniele, Naples, and you can read about that event. No words to describe it. Lucio Dalla <laughs> is in a mural. He's not from Naples. He from, he's from Bologna, but how he loved Napoli and how the Neapolitans love Lucio Dalla. All these names, you may want to hear their music. Uh, here's Pino looking at the uh, fresco of Peppino de Filippo. Peppino de Filippo. 
was a screenwriter, an actor, a playwright of extraordinary versatility, and his uh, brother was an actor, Eduardo, his sister, T Titina was an actress. And he's very beloved by not just the Napolitani, but all of the Italians, Peppino di Filippo. Really, you should try to see some of these films, and I'm sure there are a lot of them will be dubbed. You don't want to miss a film of Peppino di Filippo. And if you look at this fresco, he's depicted on this orange background. He is depicted here as Gaetano Papagone. Caetano Papagoni was a character he created, and it was in a television series. Also on the walls, you saw Pino Daniele, and here he is here with Massimo Troisi, a stupendous actor. If He died tragically of heart uh, disease. He wanted to finish his film, Il Postino. Doctors told him he needed this operation, and he put it off. Don't miss the film Il Postino. I think that the literal translation is The Mailman, one of his most incredible films. And one of the frescoes shows Toto, he's eating a big plate of spaghetti, Massimo Troisi, Pino Daniele, and what's the title of the fresco? Loro di Napoli, The Gold of Naples. These three personages have to be included in the gold of Naples. I want to show you the inscriptions under them. Toto says, Io mangio, because this is from one of his famous films when he's eating this whole plate of spaghetti. Troisi says, Io sto vicino a te, and I'm right near you. Pino Daniele says in Napoletano, e Io sto qua. And that means I'm staying right here, because this is one of his most famous songs, Io sto qua. And there's Toto in the film, Devouring His Spaghetti. I have to tell you this. My father used to come to visit us, my dear dad, who's deceased. When our children were small, I remember, he would watch the Toto films on television, not understanding any Italian, and roll off his chair laughing. So check out a Toto film. There he is, Toto. That's his full name. Antonio, Grifo, Focas, Flavia, etc., etc. He was illegitimate ch <clears throat> child of somebody who was noble, nobility. His father didn't recognize him. I guess he was about 37 years old. He succeeded in being semi-legally adopted or something by another noble person. So he ends up with this huge name. But we shorten it and simply call him Antonio de Curtis, better known as Toto. There he is lived from 1898 to 1967, as you can see here. You don't want to miss a clip of a Toto film. Just absolutely a genius. And these are all murals of Toto. Here's with the dates of his birth and his death over a Vespa. And there is Toto. And a scene from one of his films. Wash hanging over the murals, wherever you are, in the Quartieri Spagnoli. This is our dear friend Roberta, uh, the wife of Adriano, and she's talking to me, explaining to me this inscription, which is a quote from one of Toto's films. Uh, under one of the frescoes of Toto, I had my picture taken with a young Iranian couple I met, and they didn't know who he was, and we talked about him, and then we talked a long time about our family trip to Iran some years ago and how absolutely extraordinary it was. And I think they were actually from Isfahan, which was our favorite city. There's Toto in a couple of his roles. And Toto appears in the Neapolitan crash scenes. And we talked about the street of the crash scene makers. You remember that in my first Naples lecture. And so you can buy a little Toto and put him right near the baby Jesus in your crash scene, if you will. He's one of the most popular figures in the Neapolitan presepi, the crash scenes. And these are more, there's the Quartieri Spagnoli with this Toto fresco. Here's another one from a famous movie uh, of Toto when he played a black person. And here, again, the wash hanging out, another image of Toto.
I read this recently written by a young person of Naples, and I don't know their name. And this young person wrote on a website about the Quartieri Spagnoli. Toto is not dead. A legend never dies. Toto lives in our hearts, our jokes and quips, in our homes, and in our back streets. He's always right there with them in the Quartieri Spagnoli. This is one of his sayings. Look at what Roberto's pointing it out, and I really love it. Good manners never go out of style. And you know, the Napolitani quote it to each other. They'll say it to their children. L'educazione non passa mai di mode. If the child forgets to say please, what do you say? Good manners don't go out of style. Now, Quartieri Spagnoli, I, I don't know who took this little video. Um, I don't, I don't know who took it actually. We're in the Quartieri Spagnoli with Roberto and uh, his uh, Adriano and his wife Roberta, and we had gone to get the pizza frita, the fried pizza at this little place near here, which you saw in my first talk. We placed it on the hood of this car right here. Do you see this? This is it's, this is our pizza on the car. Well, this woman lived in this basso here, which is called the, the street level, ground level apartments of the Quartieri Spagnoli, and. Adriano said to her, excuse me if we're eating pizza right in front of your house. And we ended up chatting. And then I just said to them, can you give me a sign of Naples and the Quartieri Spagnoli? So they started singing to me. Can we turn it up a bit here? Let's see. There's Pino too. This is this is Naples. We did not know this woman nor her sister. See her in the window, and they end up singing Napolitano, something in Napolitano. And there it is, another famous saying on a wall fresco done by Gli Scugnizzi, they wrote. We don't know who painted this. The Scugnizzi would be the street children, the street urchin, the little boys of Naples. Culture is our only salvation. And they believe that, believe me. There's culture in the Quartieri Spagnoli. It's a noble district. It's as noble for me as is the noble church of Santa Chiara. There's Toto. And we can't leave the Quartieri Spagnoli without a walk through the Quartieri Spagnoli to the Trattoria of Nenella. Now, this uh, restaurant, the Nenella, opened in 1949. Oh, by the way, Toto is called the Prince of the Laughs, Il Principe della Risata. And many a creative Napolitano became adept at l'arte di arrangiarsi after World War II. That is the art of creatively arranging oneself, the art of getting by, including a woman named Elisabetta Vitiello, who opened a small ristoro, a tiny little trattoria, which she stocked, as she would say in Napolitano, obere americani to give something to drink to the Americans. So she'd have coffee, she'd have whiskey, and other drinks. She was affectionately called Ninella, although her real name was Elisabetta. It's an affectionate Neapolitan nickname for little girls, tiny women. She was a little one. Then she all started to preparing snacks for the morning. Let me read the words in Napolitano. E marenne per a mattina. In Napolitano, that means morning snacks for the street sweepers. Eventually, she added a few dishes for her customers, like tripe and pasta fagioli, pasta and beans. 
Eventually, Nanella opened a small dining room with four tables and a counter right near the four tables where she cooked for her customers sitting there at the Trattoria Nanella. Nowadays, four of Nanella's um, grand grandchildren collaborate together, Ciro, Gennaro, Salvatore, and Geltrude, and the small locale, which um, seated 12, 60 years ago, has amplified to three rooms, accommodating 120 people, as well as outdoor seating. Now there's Chido in the middle with some of the staff. And this place is an event, eating at Nenella. On the wall inside, Nenella reigns, and around her are photographs taken by affectionate customers over the years. And this is one of the outdoor dining rooms. And there'll always be a line. I took that when I was there some years ago with my friend Silvana. We're seated. And these are all the people still waiting to eat outdoors. So this is the outdoor dining room because they're waiting for the delicious foods of Ninella's, like their famous dish, pasta con provola e patate, a poor man's dish, pasta with provola cheese, which has a bit of a smoky taste, and potatoes. And oh, how delicious is the timbalo di melanzani, which is an eggplant flan. And this is, um, these are dishes which I ate while I was there. This is mozzarella in carrozza, which is mozzarella breaded and deep fried. This was something with eggplant. These are friarelli greens, which are of the broccoli family. Eggplant. Um, these were some beans. This is the antipasto, absolutely tempting. There's mozzarella in carrozza which means literally the mozzarella in a carriage. And it's a breaded and deep fried. One of their hit dishes is zucchini alla menta, fried zucchini with a touch of mint. Uh, people love the friarelli, the greens typical of the area of Naples, Campania. And I said they have a little bit of a broccoli taste. And these are grilled sausages. And then their fish dishes, everybody loves. The pasta with uh, pomodori rossi e gialli e pesce spada, which is a pasta dish with yellow tomatoes, red tomatoes, and swordfish. If you like anchovies, this is the place for you. These are deep fried anchovies stuffed with provola cheese and prosciutto. And this is the selection of the frutti di mare, or the shellfish, which arrives in the morning at Ninellas and heads to the chefs for turning it into wondrous dishes. This is another plate, including the mozzarella in carrozza, buffalo mozzarella, prosciutto, uh, tomatoes on bruschetta, some broccoli. Foods are absolutely divine. And wow, the prices. Menu a prezzi popolari. Okay. It literally means popular prices. Translate that. People's prices. Prices for the people. Complete menu, 12 euro. <laughs> Pasta second course, vegetable dish. So one reason there are the lines outdoors. And then happy customers will pull down the basket called the Panaro. Remember in my first talk, we talked about the baskets people lowered from their windows and your groceries would be put into it so you didn't have to make three flights of stairs if you're an 80-year-old woman. Well, what they'll put in the basket here are Amazeta Pergayun, which is in Neapolitan means a tip for the boys. So these are two of the waiters who are thanking us for the tip that was put in here. They've lowered the basket from the ceiling. And when the basket is lowered, everybody shouts, grazie. We can even see this live. This is a customer, and he's going to pull the basket down. And then he puts the basket back up. And then goes and sits down. Tip was left. Now, 
This is the group, again, Chiro and his um, assistants who all work there. And I'd like to read you what Chiro said. This is Chiro. So he's, um, he pretty much heads the business now. He's the grandson of Nenella. There she is. He was asked what he considered their reason for success. He replied without hesitation. Above all the cooking and the economic prices, but we must not exclude la simpatia da la goliardia e perché no il folklore. We must not exclude, therefore, the congeniality, the unified group spirit, and why not the folklore. Here one eats well, has a good time, and relaxes, he says. And you can see it here. There's singing going on. People get up and dance in the middle of the courses. These people are clapping. The waiter, this waiter's singing. They're all singing. And here the panado is hanging above them as they're serving out at the tables, but all of a sudden they'll start their singing. Now, let's have you hear this. Yes, I am. It's a great song. I'll tell you about the song and all. You don't go here for quite intimate feel. Look at that customer. They've given him two pot legs and he's playing with us. See him, the men in black? Who did it? Who hit the center? The fact is, he's born and he's black, black, black. A black baby was born and his mama called him Chiro. Chiro's the owner of the restaurant. Look at the women getting up to dance. Now she was taking a video when she gave it to her husband to get up and dance. <laughs> we want to get back to Naples. How can people come to Italy and miss Naples? Would you like to tell me? I mean, I don't get it. Isn't that something? The words of the song, you know, this was written in 1945. At that time, there were many children born of GIs who were black and their Neapolitan mothers. And this is a beloved song. I mean, who did it? Who hit the center? It doesn't matter. The fact is he's born and he's black, black, black. And whether he calls, his mother calls him Chiro, and his name is Chiro, but he could be called Francesco or Antonio. He's black and she'll love him. It's not a rare event. There are thousands of them. If you plant the grain, what's important is that it grows. And those are the words of that wonderful song. Mm -hmm. And Chito's ready with his assistant here to open the pasta and serve you when you're ready to drop it on Naples. And we'll go together. Before we we'll leave, we'll leave the Mazzetto per Guayun, a little tip for those who served us. And we have to absolutely include Naples on your next trip to Italy. So thank you for coming to Naples with me virtually, and may we soon experience Naples live. Grazie. I thank you all for sharing this video, which should be on the virtual experiences page of my website. Thank you for sharing it, and thank you for being here, and thank you very much for your donations, which encourage me to continue this work. Grazie.